This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today we're joined by my new friend Khalil, who is the executive director of his charter school in beautiful South Carolina. We dive into a ton on this one, including some tips and strategies around teacher recruitment and retention, as well as fundraising. So a lot of good topics on this one. I know you guys are going to love it. So stay tuned and enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater, joined by a new friend out of Sumter, South Carolina, Mr. Doctor, sorry, not Mr., he's also Mr., but Dr. Khalil Graham, who is the Executive Director of Liberty Steam Charter School. They're doing some cool things there, and we have talked on the phone, so I have a little bit of background on him and his school. But as always, I do not want to take thunder away from any of the guests, so I'm going to pass it off to him to do an introduction on himself and we're going to dive in with some of the questions I have for him. So, Mr. Khalil, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here. Man, I'm stoked to have you and I know it's summer there for you now. I know when this podcast goes out, it's been, it will probably be a few months when people are listening to this one, but summer's coming. You guys are having some probably really hot weather, I would assume, already there in South Carolina. Am I right? Yeah. We actually uh, took our scholars on their first field trip of the year this week. They went to go to the uh, strawberry patch out here in Sumter and get a chance to see uh, farmland and kind of how bees and honey work in, the, in, a, in a farm. And so it was really cool to be able to see, we're getting to the part of the year where not only is it warming up, but also we, we're fortunate that we can have some opportunities to have kids actually go out and experience the community and learn there as well. Good. Finally getting back to normal, if you will, and status quo, what was what was before the world of COVID. So that's good to hear. What are uh, I've never been to that area of South Carolina before. So what are some fun things to do around there? Maybe what's that city and that area known for? Yeah, so Sumter is a town that kind of is like smack dab middle of South Carolina um, in the region called the Midlands. Um, so we are maybe about 30 miles from Columbia, the state capital and then a little over an hour from the beaches that you'd find in Charleston or Myrtle Beach uh, in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So it's an actual, you know, a really cool place to be. Um, what you would notice is a very strong military town, Shaw Air Force Base is one of the largest Air Force bases in the country, is actually located here in Sumter. So we have a really, you know, strong sense of pride for our military families and our current servicemen. Um, but then the town itself has some really cool things in terms of, you know, things for people to do here because it does have a small town feel while also being a place where, you know, we do have, you know, some things that, you know, a city might have access to, which is it's been something to get to know. So they have shows that get to come here, you know, we get some live music that's been fun. We have the largest collection of swans in the, I believe it's in the country, uh, in our Swan Lake. So if you go maybe a mile up from the school, there's a beautiful lake where they have all kinds of different swan that you can walk through and see um, that somebody who grew up here in Sumter uh, actually donated um, a long time ago to you know have a way to accelerate the beauty of the city. And so now it's kind of really renowned throughout the state that people come here to go to Swan Lake. Okay, I love that. That is super cool and very unique. And I know you guys are also into uh, barbecue in South Carolina. And the only reason I, I know that is because my wife's from North Carolina. And I didn't know that people were, there was a, comp- a competition involving what bar- barbecue is better. So what barbecue are we talking about here in South Carolina there, Khalil? I have to say, as somebody who spent a large portion of my adult life in Texas, this barbecue conversation can get a little rough, right? <laughs> so um, South Carolina, um, it's a lot of... Uh, pork-based barbecue. So you're going to get a lot of pulled pork. 
you're gonna get a lot of ribs. That's gonna be you know the top two things you see on the menu. But they try to do their own twist. You know, I've seen some places who've done some pretty cool things, smoking uh, some of their meats. So that was fun. Uh, but if you if you ask me, once the barbecue conversation starts, I try to step out and just enjoy whatever they make. <laughs> But my wife would love the, because uh, when we first got married, I didn't, I thought, when I thought of barbecue, I was thinking, hey, brisket, barbecue sauce, that's kind of what I thought. She's like, no, 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 no barbecue sauce, vinegar. And I was like, vinegar? No, 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 no. And so there's been the whole uh, argument, because I think, I think, is it South Carolina's mustard base is one of their favorites to use? Is it mm-hmm. South Carolina mustard? Yeah. So I'm not a big, huge mustard fan, but I, I think I'd like it better than vinegar. So you go, you go to a lot of the stores here and the restaurants, and they have the different ones. So they give people, you know, a pretty, you know, good flavor of choice because North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia are all so close to each other. Like we can be here in Charlotte in an hour and a half, two hours, and you can be okay. in Augusta, Georgia in an hour and a half, two hours. So between both of those places, you know, you're getting a whole different state that has all types of different barbecue considerations. So they try to give you a couple choices so people can be okay. I love it. Well, tell me a little about your uh, your school. And before we jump into some challenges and what's going good, just general, like, hey, tell me about your school and how you got to where you are specifically at your school. Yeah, so I think... Uh, tell a little bit about my story or allow for it to make sense for the transition to, to something. Okay. I'm not a Sumter native. Uh, I'm originally from New York, uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And um, in my professional career, I've been in education all the way through, you know, starting in 2008 uh, as a teacher uh, in Connecticut. And then, you know, working my way up in different positions in school leadership, higher ed, policy work. Um, So I finally got into doing a lot of work in the state of Texas. And I was there um, teaching at Southern Methodist University and also coaching new school leaders uh, with a a group called Teaching Trust. And so doing some of that work, I got a chance to really see the impact when you can cultivate really strong leadership. And people would ask me, you know, what are you, is this what you're going to do forever? Is there any other thing you'd want to do? And I said, you know, the only thing that would ever be something of interest to me was the opportunity to like be the decision maker for a set of schools or a school that like really helped steer it to where I felt it can do the best work for kids. And that's like being a superintendent or any of those type of roles. And so I said that would be interesting to me, but it would have to be the right fit. And so we get to 2020 and I've been in Dallas for a couple of years and I get a call on a... You know, now I look at it, it was fateful, but, you know, at that point it was very, you know, nondescript um, day in the middle of March as everybody was kind of figuring out what to do with, you know, this new, you know, pandemic that was presented to us. And it was somebody who was reaching out to see if I knew any friends who'd be interested in helping to start some charter schools in South Carolina. And I was immediately intrigued because I didn't know much about the South Carolina kind of charter school uh, tradition. Um, but in getting a chance to learn and meet the people here, so many of the things that I said would have to be particularly right if I wanted to go into that type of experience. I found between the board and the local community and just how passionate people were for change in education within the region where we were going to open schools. And so I decided uh, later that year to accept the position as the executive director over you know, the Liberty Charter Schools uh, kind of network that we wanted to build out. Um, we opened our first school this fall, which is a K through two primary academy that has a little under 200 scholars in grades kindergarten and first grade. And next year they'll add about 150 more. We're opening up another school in 2023-24, so a year away, uh, that will house elementary students and going into middle school. And then we'll keep opening schools to where full scale K through 12 with this pipeline and then continue to look at, you know, other opportunities to expand and open up schools that can be really great for kids. Awesome. So this will be all when, as you guys are growing, they're all going to be under that Liberty name. Like the kids are just going to move up through. Okay. Now this might come out in one of the challenges. I'm not sure. Maybe you have some different challenges, but one of the things when you mentioned being in a military town is do you guys, and I know it's still new, everything, you know, but you probably know the area. 
do people struggle with the ins and outs of people, all the PCSing to another base and leaving where you're like, well, we had a full school and now we just lost 50 kids, you know, and have to get new ones in. And is that a struggle that you expect or are currently already having for this summer? We got some of that this year and we realized that, you know, that's part of the process and being in a town that does serve a large military population. Um, we've tried to be really mindful in some of our operational mechanisms that we use to just make sure we're really aware of you know, how we're communicating with families and if that's something that's on the table to just be mindful you know we want to support the child as much as possible and then knowing that that's a you know part of our work is to make sure that we continue to communicate and collaborate with our community so if an open space were available another family might be able to take access to it so it's something we've had to build into our strategy a little different here than in other places that i've been you know i'm very fortunate um, I've been in two places that do have uh, large military populations where I've had to lead schools, uh, Washington, D.C., um, and then San Antonio, Texas. So I've gotten a chance to experience what this looks like in other places, and so a lot of it was translatable in terms of best practices. Okay. Do you guys kind of, it's your goal as a school to, to recruit as many people as possible so you have waiting lists for those moments when you lose let's say 20 kids boom you just to call the 20 people i'm assuming that's kind of what you guys are shooting for i think that, that that's pretty consistent with what you'll see at a lot of charter schools you know i think the word we try to use is engagement uh, we want to be in a place that's really engaging the families whether you're with us or not and part of those family engagement strategies when they are not a family is being really thoughtful about how we market ourselves. What is the brand that we have so that when people in the community talk about who we are, they talk about it in a way that gives not only pride, but optimism that their child might be able to be a good fit or a child that they know might be able to be a good fit. So we really look at that as a great opportunity to, to build our name, but we know that the reality is there will be some transition through the year like there is in any school. And so we wanna minimize it and on the other hand, we want to be thoughtful of if we do have families that are interested and they're on that wait list, we want to communicate with them, not just when we need them, but also sending them the newsletter that shows what we're doing so that they stay engaged with us and continue to think of us as an option that can help them and their child be successful. Awesome. I know I'll have more questions for you after we go through some of the next questions I got from you. So I think perfect segue into my first one, some challenges. So I'd, I'd love to hear, I know you guys are just getting off the ground and going and it sounds like everything's going really good, but what are some challenges you guys are kind of currently up against and, and how are you combating those currently? Yeah, so I think I'll talk about two that come to mind. I think the first one is creating a, a strong sense of alignment organizationally. And that's something that you don't maybe hear traditionally in a school, but I think when a school is looking at itself and saying, hey, we're gonna be a network of schools and we're all brand new in the first year of operation, Making sure everybody's on the same page becomes really important because most schools you go into, there might be a couple of new people, but there have been some people who've been there for a few years, and there's probably some people who've been there for many years, right? And so there's a sense of how things were done and like what's the culture been there that people will assimilate to or learn. Here in establishing a new culture, much of it's been how do we get teachers who've never potentially taught at a charter school to understand what our school expectations are? How do we get leaders who might have not led at a charter school? How do we get families who might have never attended a charter school? How do we get a board who might have never governed a charter school to all be aligned on like what's the vision and the, and the values we wanna really instill in our, our kids and what are the practices that are gonna lead us to the goals we, we wanna achieve? So that's been something where it's been a lot of teaching and a lot of building across all of our stakeholders that not only me, but my team has been really responsible for. And I think where we've prioritized is being crystal clear on like organizationally, what are the goals that we hold ourselves accountable for? You know, making those clear to everybody. We have what we call bathroom goals. And so if you go in any of our bathrooms for adults, you see the goals posted that we have for the school, academically, operationally, and for our mission. And so I think that that really builds a sense of commitment because we're not hiding it. It's not the place where you can't see it. And so we talk about those goals a lot. I think the thing that we are doing to put it in practice is we're really trying to build the way that people understand all of the things that go with operating the schools that we'll be opening. So we peel behind the curtain is what I call it. For our board members, that means that they need to come into our schools and see how we teach kids, see how we have meetings so they understand. For our teachers, we wanna train our teachers and teacher leaders on the same practices that our network staff and our school leaders use. So when we do check-ins, they all look the same. 
And so you can make it interchangeable where one person can view another check-in because it's the same practices and the same setup. So we're trying to do more of that teaching and reflecting on how people are learning as much as possible. And with our families, it's now especially when we're in a place where we can share more and we can kind of open our doors a little bit, really letting them get inside and then talking to them about what things that they notice and what things that they want to see us continue to improve on. So that's been something I think has been really helpful for us. Um, I would say a second challenge has been just really figuring out how to overcome some of the learning loss from the last year. I think opening up a kindergarten and first grade um, academy in year one is very unique because that means that none of those children have ever been in school before because last year was it, it virtual for most people, um, and specifically here in our state. And so in thinking about that, we have a school full of kids who've never been in school before. And so trying to figure out what does it look like to build their practices, to build up some of the conceptual knowledge and the foundational knowledge they needed as young learners and doing it to close those gaps as quickly as possible has been just, you know, I think a point of, of struggle for every set of schools in the country. Uh, but I think uniquely for us with so much newness and having to deal with building, you know, around those gaps has been an area we've really had to push ourselves. And I think the areas we've tried to focus on are things that are within our locus of control, which is can we have consistent teaching to standards that are going to allow for kids to learn at the grade level aptitude for whatever it might be in their in their lesson context and then also being really thoughtful around how do we provide interventions and support and so we've done things that are strategic like hiring an interventionist who pulls out groups of kids all throughout the day to work on them with different concepts and then also things that are going to just add to the general culture we want to add to the school so we partnered with um, local foundations to be able to have people who can be AmeriCorps members who do their service hours reading to our kids during the day or letting our kids read to them. And so that's something that's not tracked necessarily the same way like you would in a, a first grade math class, but it does allow for our kids to continue to get access to reading and literacy and be able to talk about books, which we know over time is going to help support them in their growth. Hmm. All right. Well, those were all good. I'm trying to think of the other questions I had. Um... There was one that popped in my head and it's escaping me at the moment. So um, what I'll do, we'll segue into the next part. And if I think of it, I'm going to come back to okay. it. But perfect segue into uh, with those two that you mentioned. Let's talk about this is the chance where the guest gets to brag about their school. So what's going really, really good? And you're just like, man, like proud of this. Maybe it's like, hey, we have these buildings going to be done next year for this next school year for the upper kids or fundraising is going really good or any, anything you think is going awesome. I'd love to hear about those. I think the first thing I'd, I'd really uh, be proud of is our community um, reception has been amazing. We've had so much commitment from families. You know, I think about our parent satisfaction surveys have throughout the year been above 90%. Our mid-year survey was at 96% parent satisfaction, which for a new school that's figuring out a lot of things is really unheard of, right? And so to see that level of parent engagement and satisfaction has been uh, really exciting. And the same thing from our community. Um, we were actually uh, given the award for uh, top elementary school in Sumter yesterday at the uh, Sumter Award. Wow. And so for a first year okay. school, uh, elementary school to, to receive that honor, you know, I really take a lot of pride in the work the team is doing and all of the different uh, commitments that they put into to making it a great environment for kids. And so we've seen, you know, that, you know, has been a huge win and a boost for, for all of the members who put in the work this year. And in knowing that, you know, one of the areas that we've really seen a lot is student growth. You know, when we look at our data and seeing that consistently, you know, we're meeting the needs for a lot of the scholars we have in our building and we're committed to closing gaps for the students who still have some areas to go. And so seeing committed small group instruction, seeing that our data points have moved from the fall to the winter and from the winter to the spring gives me a lot of encouragement that the kids who stay within our program are going to learn and grow in ways that are going to set them up for college and career success over time. Man, well, one of the things I did think of as you were chatting with all those is you guys have had this great success and you got that award, which congratulations, because that is a huge accomplishment. So congrats to you guys and the leadership you have for that. But now that made me think, okay, 
a lot of schools that I've talked to across the country, they're struggling with uh, teacher retention and teacher recruitment. That's a big thing that's come up multiple times. And here you guys go start a new school, obviously get teachers in and you're kicking butt right from the get go. Was there a specific strategy or something you kind of thought that worked for you guys to get some of these teachers in early for a, hey, join this vision of this new school that's starting in the city? Um, I'd love it because if anybody's listening that is struggling with that part, maybe they can get some ideas from you guys and your team. Yeah, so I would say right now with teacher hire specifically, we are about 85, uh, maybe even 90% towards our goal for the year. I think we have um, two, two vacancies left. Uh, so we're we're excited about that progress. Um, it's been a lot of hard work, and I think one thing that's been different for my team this year is last year with us being new, there was a lot of local community excitement because we're the first choice option that they've ever had as a public school in the city. So there were a lot of people wow. who just didn't know that a charter school could exist, and so we had people who jumped from the traditional schools, and you know some people who moved from out of state because it was new. We were fully enrolled with teaching staff probably in February. And so for this year, that's a very big difference when it's like, oh, you actually have to go through a more normal cycle where in the month of May and early June, you're still hiring and finalizing some of your roster. Um, what I think has helped us to be most successful is number one, we've got a clear owner. You know, our chief of staff, uh, Trevor Ivey, does a tremendous job in owning what does the process look like and then how do we track towards that goal? And so every week he gives updates on how many people have been hired, how many people have been interviewed, how many people are in the, in the pipeline for final interviews and what kind of uh, next steps do they have. So having really clear ownership has been helpful. I think the other thing we had to do is really be mindful of what we call the EVP, the employee value proposition, and thinking that being a teacher is really hard and being a teacher during a pandemic is even harder. And so how do we make this a place that beyond just straight compensation, because we all know we'll, we'll never be able to pay teachers what they're worth truly to our kids, what kind of things can we bring value towards that can shine a light on why we would be a great place to work? Um, the first thing is we became a great place to work. You know, We were certified by the Great Place to Work Organization for Organizational Health. We're one of the seven charter schools, I believe, uh, at the time, who have been certified nationally by Great Place to Work which lets them know that we value organizational health, right? We want to be a place that people feel like they can learn and grow and then be emotionally and physically safe. You know, we commit to wellness at a very high level. You know, we have a wellness stipend for every staff member that they can use every month for whatever wellness initiative works for them. It can be a therapy session or it can be a physical fitness session, right? And so doing things like that helps show people what we really, you know, want to do to commit to helping teachers. And then I think the final piece is we let a lot of our staff do the selling of who we are. And so the thing I always tell people is if you get a person on your campus, then you'll know exactly how they feel about you because they should see exactly who you are. And so we let them meet our teachers. We let them do shadow days. And then as they go through the interview experience, we're very thoughtful of giving them as much about the role that they can chew on. So that a person who commits to us can feel really confident that they know what they're getting into. But also for people who are interested who maybe have never taught before, they can get a sense of, you know, what's the support that they'll get to be good for kids. Because a lot of people have that heart, but, you know, sometimes it can be intimidating to know that, you know, you're going to have a class of, you know, 20 or 30 kids in front of you. And it's your goal to make sure they learn. And so people want to know what the support look like. And being in that picture really clear for them always allows for them to feel comfortable and then really set them up to know if they're going to be a choice with you that it can be a choice that they're really compelled with i love what you guys are doing for your teachers those are some valuable valuable strategies that i'm hoping listeners will be like oh i never thought about that and hopefully i don't know how that works district by district but how they go get the funds to be able to do some of those things uh, but the idea is there and i love it which also led me into my next question which was fundraising do you guys have to do anything around fundraising and have you and have any has anything been like a flop or really successful in this year that you guys have been operating yeah great question um so as a charter school in south carolina we get roughly about 60 to 65 cents on the dollar that a child would get going to a traditional public school um, and we also don't get any funding for facilities or transportation 
So it puts some unique stressors on us to make sure that we are able to get secured fundraising dollars to have the same type of quality for our children, knowing that you know some funding we're going to have to come up with to cover the gap. And so that's been a big priority for us each year. You know, I think that we have raised uh, in the two years that we're here. Uh, the first year, you know, we were in the, the seven seven figures uh, in terms of our fundraising, and this year we'll be in the six figures. So, you know, we're really excited about you know those progress goals we've met. Uh, some things that have been wins for us is relationship building. Um, the first thing I've thought of is you, know, you can't go up to you know a potential person of influence and just ask them for a million dollars or ask them for a thousand dollars. It doesn't work that way. But building relationships with people where they know who you are, they know what you stand for, and they know where resources can be allocated. When it does come to that time where you could say, hey, we would love for your support, that's where you feel like you've built enough trust and they have enough understanding so that they can potentially see themselves making that type of commitment and feeling really good about it. So that's you know just an area that has worked well for us. I also think that we found success in being really mindful around being associated with initiatives that kids can directly be a part of, right? And so when we think about ways to fundraise for trips, to fundraise for you know student initiatives or student uh, rewards, that's something that people can easily get on. You know, one thing we wanted to do during the Christmas uh, season is we wanted to give, you know, extra resources to our kids, right? And so we did an angel tree where people were able to select, hey, your $500 gift actually buys this many, you know, supplies for kids. Or if you give $1,000, here's what it actually buys. So we were able to paint that picture. And that was able, I think, for us to build a lot of local enthusiasm around hey, I want to sponsor two classrooms. Well, I, I don't have a million dollars, but I've got a hundred dollars and this would be a perfect thing for me to give to. So having strategic initiatives like that was really helpful for us. Uh, an area that I would say probably didn't work as well was trying to do the uh, big dinner, like the uh, let's have a gala. You know, we thought about ways to do that. Uh, unless you have a person on your staff who is specifically designed and, and, and that's their role of responsibility is to host those type of events, which most schools don't, right? They don't have a, a staff member at the school whose job is to be event coordinator. Uh, it becomes logistically, you know, it can be challenging and making sure you find a place and making sure who's picking out the menu and who's doing, you know, what color are the napkins going to be. All of those things that can, can, at a big level, take up some time. We just didn't see the value add in doing that as much as some of the other things that we felt were high impact strategies. So, you know, if a person is there or somebody wants to volunteer their time to do that for, you know, a school or a network of schools, I'm sure that that can be really helpful. But for us, it didn't just didn't seem like a great strategy based on the resources we had. Okay. My son's school just did one this past, just this past weekend. And there was, it's our first one they've done, I think like this since COVID kind of getting back to the, the in-person stuff and it was really fun i don't know if they they didn't meet the goal that they had but they definitely learned some stuff of what to do in the future and what i actually really liked about it was there's this local uh like hard cider place that doesn't offer food it's, they just sell their their cider they have a nice outdoor area so they always have some type of food truck there where people can buy food so the school came in and was like hey we have two people in our school that have food trucks or restaurants so they brought those in and part of those proceeds would all go to the school and then we had kid stuff like snow cones and popcorn and face painting and we did a raffle and people donated like um like we donated a, a website for to be raffled off in there for for people if they some, somebody needed a website and uh and it was fun they, and they made you know a few thousand dollars on it it wasn't because it's a tiny school but i was like i know it wasn't their main goal but i liked it because people were from the community already attracted to go to this place to drink cider on a saturday uh, when it was a hot day and then like oh food oh raffle oh music or whatever and so there's just I feel like the fundraisers that are hard are the ones where you're like trying to get, hey, come to our school at six o'clock at night and let's go through the halls and let's go to this like this dinner if it's at the school. Like those are hard. I feel like just getting people where they're at and trying to get a piece of something from them or letting them buy into your school's vision or whatever. I feel like it's more more on the on that side a little bit better, but uh, we'll see what we're going to do next year for it. And it definitely, I think I would add to that, it's so dependent on like who's leading the initiative because you know we've done some of both right so i can give you an example we hosted what we call invitational tours where we would 
invite people from the community into the school. Very similar to what you said. They do a tour, they get a presentation from me. But that's a month process to get 40 people to come to the school who we feel would be highly influential. And that's calls, and that might be going to their business and personally giving them an invite. That's making sure the day before that they get an email with all the agenda. Like It's a lot of work that somebody has to own, right? And so we had a person on our team who was really, really invested in doing that that made that successful to help us to build continued support, whether it's financial or we've had somebody who's donated books. We've had you know, people who donated their services. And so that's been really helpful. But we've also seen wins from partnering with the local cafe and saying, hey, we're actually going to tell our parents that they should go to your cafe on Wednesday. We'd love, you know, 10% of the proceeds from 6 to 9 when yeah. parents are picking up their kids and going to go get something to eat. And so that worked for us where we would literally say, hey, a parent was going to get something anyway. Why don't you support the school by eating here? So we've done some different things that both have been high lift and low lift to kind of see what works. And it really just comes to how well have we communicated and who's been the person who's kind of led the, the charge with it. Okay. Well, it definitely sounds like you guys have all the pieces in place. You have great leadership, obviously, in yourself. And it sounds like the guy above you and the teachers. So I think you guys are going to do, do just fine as you guys continue to grow. So as we kind of wrap things up, I always end with you know pretty much the same type of question for every guest is, for all the school leaders listening, if you were to leave them with some type of advice or anything you wanted to share with them, what would that piece be? You know, a mindset that I continually push our team with is the mindset of focus on winning the day. And why I say that to people is it's so easy as a leader to get caught up thinking about long-term goals that we have for our schools, for our kids, for our staff. You know, you start a year and you're thinking about where do you want kids to finish on the test and where do you want your staff to finish. But I really tried to hone our team into while we have these long-term goals that we want to be clear about, what's most important is the behaviors that lead us to have a great Tuesday, to have the best Wednesday possible, and to build on those. And when you don't have the best day, how do you make the next day a best day for you, right? And so we talk about win the day, we have it on the walls for the kids, and we try to really embody that mindset in everything we do, and that we're not gonna be perfect, but that every day is a chance to get better. And I think that if leaders model that in their behaviors and in their actions and how they speak to their teams, that you'd be amazed at what kind of progress you do make over the course of that year with even one class or with a whole school. And so win the day, focus on what's working, and then learn from what didn't work so you can get better the next day. I love it. I think it's a great way to wrap it up, Mr. Graham. So uh, thank you. I mean, thank you for giving up your time to hop on the podcast and thank you for pouring into that next generation. And you've, uh, <clears throat> your story is very cool from going from, from Brooklyn to DC, Texas to now over there to like, yeah, I'll start a charter school. Why not? Let's try it out. And then you're there and it's successful and it's growing and you guys have a plan forward. So wishing you and your school nothing but the best. And uh, thank you again for giving of your time. You've been an awesome, awesome guest. I appreciate being here. I'm really excited about continuing to do the work. And anytime I can speak about education, that's always a great time for me. Awesome. Thanks, man. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Khalil for taking time and being on the podcast today. I loved our chat and I easily could have chatted with him for longer. He's an awesome guy. He's passionate about his school and education, and I'm wishing him and his school nothing but the best as they continue to grow here in the coming years. And as always, I hope you guys could take at least one thing from today's episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Maybe it's around that teacher retention and recruitment. He gave some really good strategies and tactics that they're using that seems like it's been working really, really good. Or maybe it's around some of the fundraising ideas he mentioned. He had a lot of good tidbits. So if you need to, obviously, rewind. Go watch it. Listen to it again. There's some good, good stuff in there. And if you guys are struggling as a school with enrollment or figuring out how to use technology to talk to these people that are interested in enrolling in your school or are currently enrolled in your school, I'd love to hear from you. Please visit us online, schoolsuccessmakers.com. That's schoolsuccessmakers.com. Dot com. I'd love to hear from you. Or maybe you're a Facebook buff and you're just like, I love Facebook. I love connecting with people on Facebook. Well, then I want you to join our private Facebook community just for school leaders. It's called School Success Makers. It's School Success Makers. Hop in there and join. Khalil's in there as a member and a lot of the past podcast guests are on there as well. We'd love to see you in there as well. School Success Makers, private Facebook group on Facebook, of course. 
And guys, we'll be here next week with another amazing guest as usual on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.